Good evening. Afternoon still, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, welcome to Apologetics 101. Uh, a pretty easy course, actually, and it's going to have to be because we're going to move so fast. Uh, when I taught it in the Philippines, I had a total of 60 hours to teach it. So uh, we've got a total of uh, uh, approximately uh, one hour for seven weeks, and the pa pastor's been gracious to give us that. But that means I've got to talk real fast, or you've got to do some homework, and the answer is going to be you're going to hopefully uh, have time to do a little bit of homework. Uh, how many uh, do not have copies of the notes yet? Still a fairly, hmm, that's surprising. Copies? copies? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, how many people, maybe it would be easier to ask, how many have copies of the notes? Okay. All right. Well, we don't have a choice. We're just going to have to go ahead and proceed, and then we will catch up with that. Uh, the notes issue, hopefully we'll have some more next week and maybe uh, some extras uh, the following week. Uh, as, as, as I get going in this subject, I think it's important to make sure that all of you know that I'm not coming in terms of um, uh, anybody's questions, the degree of skepticism or questions you may have. The, the important thing, I think, is that um, you come with an open mind about uh, possibilities, the answers that, uh, that we will be giving to many questions. We won't have answers to all your questions. I don't uh, purport to be some kind of a genius uh, um, um, scholar or something like that. I, I have a, an undergraduate philosophy degree, a master's degree in philosophy, and a master of divinity degree in the law degree. It, it, that doesn't necessarily mean that I got special training in apologetics. Uh, but I've been studying the field a long time, and I think the notes will help you a lot. So um, when uh, hopefully we'll have, uh, we'll, we'll have those notes, uh, if not for everybody this Sunday, the next Sunday. Um, and uh, the notes are very important because the notes carry, uh, carry in them um, something that I really want you to spend a little bit of time on, and that's the resource material. Uh, the resource material is, is really critical mass. If you have your notes, those of you who do, uh, I, I want to say to you that there is one person here that fits in the category of sort of monster skeptic, and uh, even though that's okay, if you'll turn to page 39 in your notes, the monster skeptic, that, that tough skeptic, if you'll look at page 39, is my life as a skeptic, chapter five. I spent about five years deeply engaged in asking lots of serious questions, lots of serious questions. Um, so much so my, my dad had, uh, worried about me. And I remember he said one time to me, David, can you go hear Clark Pinnock, who was a theologian at Trinity Evangelical and was so impressed with Clark Pinnock. The series of salient questions were a lot different than they are today to some degree. Uh, language analysis, the, uh, uh, the uh, rather existentialism held value or was that a dead end street? So you uh, saw from Schaefer's work, Francis Schaefer, who remembers Francis Schaefer from years ago, the apologist at La Bray. Uh, the, but the, those questions are kind of different, and, and as society moves, you get a different kind of question. Look at, uh, look, look at this young skeptic, though. Um, he says, when I was a college student, I decided to test my own beliefs and that of others. I was a philosophy student at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. I determined to not eject my Christian beliefs, but to be willing to seriously subject them to scrutiny. And I had actually already started that process at about 16 years old. I was a troublemaker even then, and asked a lot of questions even then. It seems like I couldn't do anything but ask a lot of questions, and was sometimes a little on the obnoxious side probably as I asked them really seeking answers. I was really looking, but I wanted to maintain my faith, but subject the faith to serious inquiry and scrutiny. 
And I was dead serious about that. Uh, I would be willing to seriously subject them to scrutiny, the second paragraph. I would try to respond with a Christian defense if I could, but if I determined Christianity at its heart was untrue, then I had decided I would abandon it. That's how serious I was. I was seeking truth. I was seriously seeking truth. I was a believer. My dad was a very good Baptist preacher. He did a good job uh, on topical sermons and exegetically. And uh, so I had learned the Bible pretty well, pretty well. Not to the degree I would have learned it even 10 years later when I understood its incredible coherence and self-attesting truths that we will study about. But I had it in my mind, I want to know about comparative religions. I want to know about all the philosophical attacks that I hear being made, including language analysis. I wanted to understand scientific uh, 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 angles, including evolution. Uh, of course, I had been taught that at a public school. Dad and I had had many debates about evolution. So I came on the scene, and, and the rest of this, this could have been 30 pages just on that, but I tried to shorten it. But as, as, as you will go through that, hopefully, and see uh, what I was questioning. And I was questioning theology. I had serious questions about the Trinity. And so I went through all those things over a period of years until I became satisfied that I could deal with these things. And turn back to page one, and let's go ahead and get started with the outline. We're going to hear um, two videos that will start at 15 minutes till, so I've only got, I've got at this point about um, maybe 20 minutes, something like that, to get to um, substantially where we want to go, and that's the first big point under the science issue that is, uh, I think, one of the most incredible things that we Christians have before us. Now, for you who are, you know, let's, let me just assume everybody here is a skeptic to some degree or another, okay? That, that way I can say we skeptics, because everybody's got a question. Everybody has a question they'd like to know. I wonder how, what's the answer to that? I wonder if in heaven we'll know the answer. In heaven we'll know most everything if we're capable of knowing it. I can't say absolutely, but if we're capable of knowing in heaven, we'll know the answers to everything. Now, therefore, we skeptics to some degree or another, I think what I want you to do is, is I want to encourage you to do this. Try to keep an open mind as I, as I talk about Christians. Uh, well, just understand, you may not be a Christian here. You may be a skeptic to the point that, no, you've abandoned the faith like I was willing to do. I want to tell you that I understand you. I understand you. I just want you to do as I at least tried to do, and I think I was successful. I tried to maintain an open mind. I really wanted to hear the debate points. And boy, in philosophy, you debate all the time. You're, you're constantly engaged back and forth. I'll get into that in just a little bit. What, uh, what is uh, apologetics, and why should we be studying apologetics? It's to understand what the Bible's saying. Is it true or not true? How do we defend the faith? And, and in that point in time, it's not just defending yourself, as Peter talks about right here. I, th now this, by the way, is the outline. Notice at the top, brief outline. And then we get to about page 9, starts the full, in, the whole enchilada. So, but, but this is kind of a little preliminary in, in, in terms of overview. Uh, why are we doing this? It's because it will help us, as Pastor was just talking about, it will help us in our understanding of the faith as well as be able to help other people who might ask of us, why do you believe so-and-so? Why aren't you a uh, Muslim? Why, why do you believe Jesus is uh, God? So there are all kinds of questions that can arise that, that studying apologetics can help. Basically, it's a self-defense mechanism. I was going to give you a, an actuality and show you a little self-defense moves, but uh, where's Robert Graziano? But I was going to use Robert Graziano. You know, he only has like a 10th degree black belt in karate, but I thought it'd be too dangerous, so I said I'm going to abandon that. In the middle of the page, you're going to see uh, that we will be looking at uh, types of apologetics, and then where you see overview with colon, uh, scientific breakthroughs in the past 50 years that impact the issue of creation and the creator. And so we will be looking at the first one in particular with the videos tonight. Uh, in, in particular that we now 
are certain there was a creation. And, and what does this mean relative to the so-called steady state theory? Steady state theory, how many have heard of that? Uh, lots of you have heard of steady state theory. It's now gone. It's in the historic waste bin. Uh, and, and what is the significance of this? This has just happened in the last 30 years. Steady state is gone. What is steady state? That means that material, time, and space, the theory of steady state, is that the material world, mass, time, and um, um, space were eternal. Were eternal. That's the theory. And therefore, you didn't need a creator if they were eternal. Hence, steady state. That has only been around as a theory, not in those words, but has only been around in a, as a theory for about 3,000 years. And it's been overturned in the last 30. This is big news. Stop the presses. Hold on. Hold it. This is a big deal. We'll get to that. That's what some of the videos are about. And you can find that. And I, I put that all in your notes and your resource notes. We'll look at scientific things. The second one is as big as the first one, nearly. But the first one is truly a miracle. The second one is truly a miracle. It's just not so much discussed in the Bible as the first one. The first one's the creation. See, according to the steady state theory, the Bible was wrong from the outset. In the beginning, God created. Steady state, uh-uh, Bible's got it wrong. So the opposition, atheists, the hard skeptics, wanted to use that to say, see, we don't need a creator because all the stuff that you see in the world, uh, space, time, and uh, matter slash energy have always been. Uh, and I would say, no, only God has always been. And, and see, the argument then would roll around, well, if, if God could always be, so could these things always be. Nothing was inherent within matter, space, or time, I would argue, that would say otherwise. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, as we go along, now drop down to the last paragraph on page one. We're going to conduct this, and I've got my go-to-trial suit on today. Yes, I've got a vest on for a purpose. If I'm trying a case, I'm going to wear my vest. I'm going to wear my vest because we're trying a case. And this is serious. And I'm going to be speaking to you, the jury. Yeah, you're going to be the jury. The only thing I ask of you, fellow skeptics, is that you keep an open mind. Because we're going to be looking at something very interesting as we start the trial up, looking at evidence for the existence of God and what skeptics might hold as evidence against the existence of God. I want you to think the same way I would tell a jury. What we would say to a jury would be, you're here to try this case. This particular case, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is a civil trial as opposed to a criminal trial. Nobody's being tried here on criminal charges. It's civil. And there's a standard that you look for. It's called preponderance of the evidence. And so it would be as if this, these were scales. And sometimes I'll take my, my scales from my office. You know, the justice and lady justice. And she's, you know, got the, got the blind fold on. And she's holding that. And then I will use that. And I will, well, we'll just use my arms this time. But suppose this is the evidence standard. And 50% plus one, okay, turned around. Let's do it this way. 50% plus one is about straight up. Plus a little, that's preponderance. So if you can get enough evidence, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, to, to kind of get you to that point, you would find for us. On the other hand, if the other side uh, says no, 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 and, and pushes that evidence standard down, then in a civil trial, you wouldn't get a verdict for you. So you're looking for preponderance. Now, obviously, you, you might say, well, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm looking for. Well, I'm asking you to think, what would you be looking for in a case where we're looking at the existence of God? The truth of God. And we're going to be looking at evidence. And I'll sort of be throwing out to you, what is your standard? Now, when I was going through what I was going through in, in, you know, as a young person, at 18 years old, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, along in there in college, even into graduate school, even into graduate school, here was the issue. How much evidence do I need to really say, Lord, I think you may be real. I'm going to take this whole thing seriously. 
Okay, how much? And the answer was, just get me a little and make sure I'm not believing something that's absurd. I don't want to believe something that's absurd. So if I can get enough evidence to... So you know where I was? I, even though I had not articulated it, it was about not preponderance, but just get me there. 20%, 30%. That's where I was. And then as I got rid of problem after problem, the evidence level kept going and going and going. And it got me to finally what the standard is for a criminal case beyond any reasonable doubt. So if I were prosecuting a case, as I've done a few prosecutions, I do mainly defenses, so I take the opposite position. But if I'm prosecuting a case, I'll say, now to make this man guilty and send him off to prison for this bank robbery or whatever, we, the state, have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt so if you've got any doubt at all, well, that's not a reasonable standard, I don't think, for if, you, if you're being fair. That's not a reasonable standard for going into apologetics and looking at it. And because we don't offer proofs when the Bible says, in the beginning, God created. Tell me what the proof was. There's no proof. He just made a statement about the creation, that this was a real thing that happened. It was not made up. And you're just told that this is who did it. There was a creator. And here's the thinking behind it. And, and when you go to, uh, when you go to uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, this is exactly the idea that you see the creation and then there's a logical inference from that. If you see the creation, you're going to pretty well instinctively know there's a creator. Now, as we look at these evidences, we're going to be looking, first of all, at the scientific ones there in the middle of the page. But then we're going to continue looking at evidences that we'll talk about. And now flip your page to page two. Remember, this is the outline. I'm trying to get you oriented a little bit before we light into the actual scientific stuff that has happened. At the top of the page, you'll see what we'll see in chapter one. Chapter one is going to be the more classical arguments and it's kind of a uh, there's a lot of C.S. Lewis going to be built into this uh, the, the, there's, there's a lot of Bible built into this for, uh, at the very outset because ultimately what I'm going to be trying to do is get you to see how important the history of the Bible is of an, as an evidentiary standard you can look at stuff in the Bible and it becomes evident because it's good history and we rely on history all the time. So we will look at the issue of something, this is a cool word, you ready for this? Epistemology, theory of knowing. How do we know something? And what constitutes valid knowing? What constitutes, we might know a lot of things that are not valid, no. But what things can we have in this presentation that I'm gonna be giving you in court so to speak, as you members of the jury to show you this is good information for you to make a decision on. And you go away saying, I like that. That was impressive. That was really impressive. I mean, that took me from mm, not really knowing to just about that preponderance. Level. And you know what? If I can get about in there, somewhere in there, that much evidence, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to turn my back on God. You're going to hear me say that phrase a lot. Don't walk away from God. Don't turn your back on God. If God's presented himself, and there's a lot of stuff going on, so that you can say, you know, there, there, there's a lot of evidence here. Preponderance, where are you? Making a decision. So I'm wanting you to think in terms of as you're, how many of you have served on a jury before, either criminal or civil? Half of you? Oh, at least half, yeah. You understand what I'm saying. And, and we've watched all these TV shows where these standards are at work. Why is it legitimate to look at it this way? Because this is the world of evidence. I live in this world. But sometimes what happens is philosophers, I live in that world too, philosophers will keep moving the target. Oh, no, oh, that, oh, you answered that? Well, I'll move it over here. Well, be careful for that little trick we philosophers play. It's this kind of gimmickry. It's called sophistry. Have you ever heard that term? It's called sophistry. 
Now, you as members of the jury, I'm wanting you to be really fair and, and objective. That's what I'm kind of counting on. Uh, I was listening to Ravi Zacharias uh, this morning, and he said something disturbing. I'm not sure I agree with him, but he said something that um, really kind of bothered me. He was talking about, um, he was talking about uh, a writer named Philip Johnson who said, are you, he was quoting him, are you an atheist for intellectual reasons or for moral reasons? Are you an atheist, a, a, a hardcore skeptic, for intellectual reasons or for moral reasons? Is it really an evidence that has convinced you of your position or is it inconvenient and will change your lifestyle? Because believing in God will change your lifestyle. And once you get into Christianity, it will really change your lifestyle. It costs you nothing to get in and everything to keep going. Interesting. Kind of a paradox. The next sentence he said was, philosophical pre-commitment to naturalism and not evidentiary is total prejudice. So when I have the task of choosing a jury, what I will do is do everything I can to try to make sure you're neutral and open-minded. So I challenge you today in your skepticism, wherever you may be, particularly if you're hard on your skepticism, I challenge you to do this. I challenge you to really think, am I having an open mind about this? And I would like for you to be like I was when I was going through this myself. I had an open mind to it. I was going to look at the positives and the negative and truly judge. And that was my history. And I hope you'll have time to look at those three or four pages there. Now, uh, let's look at uh, some of your resources that you have because beginning on page, the bottom of page two, and we'll look at Shindy now in just, just a second. So, Patrick, if you can get Shindy ready for us. Uh, there's a great apologist I've found, and I want to show you some of the things that you'll find in your, in your notes. And if we're ready for Shindy to go up, this is... Uh, a PhD in quantum mechanics uh, at Duke, and he is an apologist. An apologist, uh, he's got quite a website, so are we up yet? Okay, there you go. Here he is, Neil Shindy, and we're not up there. Okay, okay, we're up. All right, um, you can see if, I'm just choosing him because he's a favorite. I'm, I mean, I'm really like Neil Shin. He could be another C.S. Lewis. Um, notice, uh, why should we believe that Christianity is true? Paradox of atheism, that's fascinating. Science and religion. Um, look, do quantum, this, this will come up later in the first, um, do quantum fluctuations show that something can come from nothing? Quantum fluctuation. Don't worry about it. Just keep that little phrase in your mind. Uh, who, who here has uh, studied much in quantum mechanics? Raise your hand if you're a quantum mechanics guy. Two, three. Uh, that's his specialty. That's the guru. And uh, he, he, he's a fundamental believer. PhD at Duke. Uh, he's got, let's scroll it up and go to all the, this is fascinating stuff. We will get to, um, keep going. We will get to his responses. All right, stop there. We will use him later, his response to Harris, to Price, to Dawkins, wonderful responses. The guy's a philosopher, too. I mean, he is a, a, a very, very good philosopher. Uh, and you usually don't see that great combination of science and philosophy. Okay, uh, keep going. And he's got here an outline, so go ahead and click down to Apologetics Course Notes. I'm just showing you now. Look, if you don't like my outline, take his outline. I'm okay with that. All right, now let's go up to another site that you will find. And, and this one is going to be something that's in your notes called Apologetics 315. I like this one. And you could go to right there and click it, 100 Christian Apologists, boom, and 100 Christian Apologists start. You can go to any of these 100 and spend an hour or two hours or three hours immersing yourself in some of the most brilliant thought you can imagine. So it's there for you. And that's just the beginning because guess what? When you start flipping through page three, keep going, page three. Okay, turn the lights back up. Page three, page four, page five, YouTube stuff. 
uh, website stuff. I spent a lot of time just a kid. And that's just the beginning. It's just the start. Oh, uh, 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 another, one to, um, another one to look at, by the way, is um, I want you to go to the third one down on page four, Dr. Sarfati. I love Sarfati. Um, he runs or is heavily engaged in an organization called Creation Ministries International. I made a mistake and thought he was still with Answers in Genesis, the last sentence on paragraph three of page four. Mark that out. His group is Creation Ministries uh, International, and it is a great website full of information and articles. So th there's so much stuff here. If you don't like my presentation, I've just given you enough stuff. To, to, to be able to just do lots and lots of work on. Um, now what I want you to do is the summary keeps going on chapters 2, 3, 4, and you finally get to chapter 5 and 6 on page 8. That's just preliminary. When you do your homework, you're going to just be flipping through that to make sure you've got a big picture. Now we get to page 9, and we're just about to the video, so... We hustle along here. Christian Apologetics Extended Notes. Are you on page nine? The Extended Notes is more on what is apologetics. So as you do your homework, and again, we don't have, I don't have time to spoon feed this to you, so we're pretending like we're A, a class. We're pretending like B, we're in a courtroom. So I'm, you know, we're, I'm coming to this from all kinds of interesting directions, right? So please do your homework. I only need for you to read through page 15. That's all. So if you'll just read through for your homework for next week, just page 15, and that way we can be off and running pretty fast in our analysis that we're doing. Um, there's a disclaimer that I, wanna, uh, that I want to give to you. Now flip the page, but that's coming in just a second. And now we're to where I want to finally get to. We've talked about evidence, uh, evidentiary standards on page 10, middle of the page, what constitutes typical evidence that is valid evidence for belief. Valid evidence for, that's kind of a little key phrase, is something to that, because you can believe stuff and see stuff that may not be valid. And one of the things that's awfully important here is to understand how valid is history. How do you know who Abraham Lincoln was? How do you know who Julius Caesar was? What place did, uh, what, what place did uh, George Washington play in American history? History. So that's a valid source of information. Why do I want to push that as we keep these discussions going? Because what is the Bible? It's 1,500 years of history written by 40 people over 1,500 years when God reveals himself. So as we accumulate information, more and more we will begin to go into that, that sort of a gravitational, this is where we need to end up. Because ultimately the question for us is going to be, is Christianity true? Uh, but the question we face right now at the bottom of page 10 is this big scientific breakthrough I've been alluding to. And that is the steady state theory has been overturned. Real quickly, here we go. Uh, bottom of page 10, you could write in at that last paragraph on the bottom of page 10, do you see major scientific truths? Okay, here we go. You could put scientific breakthroughs, you could put stop the presses, you, you, you could put all kinds of exclamation points because I really want you to get what has happened. The significance of that, it's easy just to skim through and miss the point. Um, major scientific truths have emerged that take us much further along the truth trail. The following big issues, huge, massive issues, have emerged fully in the past 40 to 50 years and have sent the existence of God issue into completely different gear. The atheists have been hit with a frontal assault by the following scientific truths in the past 70 years, beginning with the realization of the implications coming out of the theory of general relativity. The following repeated confirmation of the general theory and modern telescopic, telescopic and antenna issues and, 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 and satellites and outer space, all that stuff, have enabled astrophysicists to determine and examine the far reaches of the cosmos and year after year discover more and more about the laws governing the creation event and the fine-tuned that's point number two below, forces that make the existence of the cosmos possible. Here are the major scientific truths that bring to sharp folks the reality of a supreme being. The now almost universally accepted fact that the universe had 
a beginning. When I was a philosophy student, an undergraduate philosophy student, we would debate this all the time. David, you can't prove there was a beginning. Uh, and that, now, already, the information coming from the results of Einstein and some of, the, some of the things coming out were beginning to confirm the second law of thermodynamics. That was the argument I would use. The, the winding down, the cooling, as the, uh, as the universe says, the cooling is going to be... I said, that, that is happening. So how could there be the eternality of matter, space, and time if, if, if the second law of therm, therm, doesn't the second law imply that it was created? So that was kind of my fallback. But you see, you're having to, you're having to make two jumps you're having to argue the validity of second law of thermodynamics on the existence of matter, space, and time. And that implies then a creation, and the creation then implies heavily a creator. So you have two jumps to go through, and they would always have arguments to try to combat your second law theory. Turned out, we were right. Now, now remember, I was a skeptic, but I was trying to give them a hard time too. I wasn't just giving my side a hard time. I would jump on them too. And along comes this new thing that has given such impetus. And you're going to see it with Dr. Schroeder in just a minute. Now, there's, there's no issue among contemporary scientists that astrophysics, the cosmos, was created. It was created. Now, we're going to, we, we may differ and we'll, we'll go into the disclaimer in just a second. But look, this, this is really astonishing. The now, number one on page 11, the now almost universally accepted fact the universe had a beginning. The steady state theory of matter, space, and time as being eternal is now an historic waste heap. The implication is seismic. A creator logically requires, a creation requires a creator. And if you think, oh, well, we can get around this somehow with laws that must have been pre-existent or, or, or in existence prior to the creation, well, that in itself means there was a lawgiver. So they said, well, maybe there was gravity that had some kind of quantum fluctuation or something. Uh, Shinvi deals with that and debunks that, as do, does Dr. Lennox. We'll see videos on Dr. Lennox. You'll see about 20 videos in this series, uh, snippets, sections, and all that. All right, um, I, I go into sort of the history of this at Mount Wilson, uh, where, um, uh, using, where, where Edwin Hubble uh, and, and kind of the background on that, then look down about 10 lines down. The creation event was not an explosion. Watch this now. This is the last sentence under number one. The creation event, according to them, the astrophysicists, was not a chaotic explosion. If I lit, if I scared the daylights out of pasture and lit a cherry bomb right now, threw it up, and it blew up right in the air, would coherence come out of that? Would something happen and it just start making itself up into life? little ants and, and bugs and, you know, a little sun, you know? No, if we stood and watched it for a million years, 10 million, how about a billion? They really get big numbers. Nothing would happen to it. But what happened, according to their understanding, this is not us, this is them, this is scientists, is that coherence came out of this event. And the coherence was not mere a little bit of coherence. We're going to see next week. It was so finely tuned as to defy logic in, in the sense of probability. That's called fine-tuning. There was no fine-tuning argument 45 years ago when I was undergoing debates with these people and going through my own analysis. This is huge news. There was a creation. Steady state is dead. There was a creation. Now think about that for a minute. Really? There really was a creation. And guess what? There was a creator. And the more you study it, the more you realize it's true. I mean, I knew it was true, but it's really true. I mean, you get excited about this. I could almost get sort of like tongues or something. We talked about that in my Sunday school class today. Don't worry, I'm not going there, Pastor. But this last sentence, the creation event was not an explosion of chaos, but coherence replete with laws giving rise to a complete creation. So inherent in the action of the creation was total intelligence. It's just astonishing. When you see these videos, if it does not wow you, I don't think anything could, it could excite you. I mean, really, this is exciting stuff. We're going to see now 
a little bit of number two in the videos that are coming in. When you see Dr. Schroeder, now remember, he's an MIT PhD, he's a Jew. He teaches Torah, what is Torah? Uh, um, uh, that's Bible. Teaches Torah and science. And uh, Dr. Schroeder is going to tell you the physicist viewpoint of uh, the co contemporary cosmos. They're gonna, he's going to tell you where they are. So if we got in a discussion with them, it's where they would be. And, and they're all on board on this thing. Uh, steady state is now dead. It's a catastrophe for an atheistic position. So from a skeptic point of view, the old skeptic David that's still a little bit alive in me, you know, it'll never completely go away. Uh, you know what this does? This changes everything. You know what number two does? Just confirms it. You know what number three does? Blows it out of the water. I, I mean, I don't see how you can go through number one, two, and three and see their scientists talking about these things and conclude anything other that we're not just talking about preponderance, we're talking about over the top. Okay, um, disclaimer, flip the page real quick on the disclaimer. This is important. Um, real, real, real quick, you will be seen as we study, this is the uh, first full paragraph. You'll be seen as we study the apologetic series when we deal with science time frames that might not coincide with the young earth belief. At various viewpoints, as various viewpoints are discussed, please be aware that we are not advocating time frames or the supposed reality of the Big Bang, but rather we are looking at the evidence, not the conclusion necessarily that, that could be reached and could be incorrect. For instance, some scientists may have concluded from evidence that there was a point time creation. We do not assert the Big Bang was God's creative event recorded in Genesis 1, nor are we advocating that the Big Bang ever happened. I'll leave it, you know, I don't know if it happened or not, I wasn't there. So I don't know if the Big Bang was Genesis 1 or not, I don't think so. Because, well, there, there are theological reasons that, that create serious problems. Listen to the evidence that leads them to reject the steady state argument. That's the main thing. That's the main thing. Steady state is gone. So no matter which position you come from, it's creation. Um, and, hold, uh, and, and holds to their, their creation event. You can be selective in considering uh, his evidence and not necessarily adopt his time frame, reject their conclusion that the Big Bang was equivalent to Genesis 1. Or another example, and, and then I give the Cambrian uh, explosion. You can read that separately. I think of it this way, though. You, you never want to tie a scientific conclusion Let's say quantum mechanics, for instance. Quantum mechanics has incredible implications for free will. It's just astonishing. It's absolutely astonishing. I've been an advocate for free will for a long time. My Calvinist friends don't understand how you can have the two together, but it's really true. You can. There can exist an intention and, and exist as a reality. But uh, we, we would never say, I'm tying one to the other. What if there were a... a, 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 a some problem with quantum mechanics later on, then they'd say, ha, see, your free will uh, 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 theology doesn't work. No, 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 no. You never tie them together like that. So don't get caught up in, in doing that. You have to be careful for those theologians that want to do that. They want to say, Big Bang was Genesis. Well, be careful for that now. And it, may, it might be. It could be they could be somehow, someday reconciled. I don't quite get it. But I, I, I stand back with that. You can hold things in suspension. At least you can know this is what they think and what they believe. You're going to hear two quick videos. One is Schroeder. One is Schroeder. Uh, and he's going to be talking about had he advocated a, a creation event when he was teaching in MIT. He said, I would have lost tenure. That means he would have been fired. I would have lost tenure. He says, would, you know, you, you, creation? There's no creation. It was totally anathema. You couldn't do that. Anathema, that wasn't in the faith system then. But now the evidence has overwhelmed that. No more steady state. There was a creation. So you're going to hear him talk. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about his total conclusion later about this, uh, 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 this fluctuation idea that you'll say, oh, don't worry about that. We'll, we'll bring it up when we take up Shinvi again. Then you're going to uh, hear another video. It's only about, I think, eight, eight minutes, some, something like eight minutes. So if you just bear with me, we're off and running. And, and that, I'm sorry, Pastor, but put everybody out about five minutes late, but we're almost on, almost on track. Fire away, Patrick. Background from... MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, bachelor's, master's, PhD, seven years in the physics staff, seen a whole range of atomic bombs detonated, moved to Israel, met my wife, Barbara Sofer, a great writer, and uh, then uh, teach Torah and science. So luckily, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that I have the two that come together. And one of the questions is a, that I'm asked as a scientist is how can a scientist really believe that there's something that we refer to usually as God? You know, is this metaphysical whatever acting in the world or producing the world? And the irony is the question's really a non-starter. Science has, in fact, 
discovered God. And you can talk to the hardline atheists and they will say, it looks like science has indeed discovered God. And how would that be? Well, if you take the trouble of going to the web and, and they're typing WMAP, the initials for, for a satellite, it's a diagram that shows the development of the universe from the creation over time. It's a timeline. Every word on that diagram comes from the NASA site. It is the condensed knowledge of the scientific community of how the universe created and how it got to where we are today. Each of the lines, the vertical lines, is another billion years. Okay, you start from a burst of energy at the extreme left side of the diagram, and you end up at the far end with the oval. The oval sh is to indicate expansion in all directions. Of course, because it's a timeline, we can't show that on, on a single piece of paper. We see here, most amazingly, that on the extreme left edge, it shows a beginning to the universe. Now go back less than 50 years. If I were teaching that at Tech, I might have, you, you know, a person could lose tenure saying that there was a creation of the universe. It sounds like it's Bible. Because less than 50 years ago, the overwhelming scientific opinion was the universe is eternal. There was never a beginning. The Bible is wrong from the very first sentence. And then we discovered, suddenly, Arno Penzies and Robert Wilson, the Bell Labs in New Jersey, the northeast of the US, discovered the echo of the Big Bang, the energy left over, which George Gamow, 60 years ago, predicted that if there had been a universe created hot and small, it would have exploded, and the energy would get more and more dilute. And, the, and Penzias and Wilson, these Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, discover this energy that had been predicted overnight. The Bible got it right. There was a beginning to the universe. Now, the black in the diagram is nothing. It's not a vacuum. Vacuums are within that diagram, within that cone of expansion. Back vacuums are empty space, and space is something. The black of the paper around the diagram is nothing. It doesn't fit in our human brain, because humans think in a box, a box made of time, space, and matter slash energy. No human, as clever as they might be, as expansive as they might be, thinks out of that box. So when we say outside that diagram is nothing, we can use the words, but we can't conceive of nothing. It doesn't fit in the human brain. How are we going to have this idea, is there a God or not? Notice that the creation force isn't a three-letter word, G-O-D. If you look at the words carefully, it's a quantum fluctuations. That understanding was first brought down by Ed Tryon, brilliant human being, in the journal Nature almost 40, 50 years, 40 years ago. The universe allows creation of something from nothing, provided you have the laws of nature, the quantum fluctuation. Tryon realized, and he published in the journal Nature, one of the two leading peer-reviewed journals in the world, that you can create something from absolute nothing, provided you've got the laws of nature, quantum physics and the laws of relativity, in other words, the laws of nature. So look what science has discovered. We can create the universe from absolute nothing, provided we have the, the, the forces of nature. Now, the laws of nature, the forces of nature aren't physical. They act on the physical. So if they create the universe, that means they predate the universe. So now we have a set of forces, we call them the laws of nature, that are not physical, that are able to act on the physical. They create the physical from absolute nothing. And they predate the universe, which means they predate our understanding of time. Put that together, it sounds very familiar. If you haven't noticed it, that's the biblical definition of God. There's only one nuance that's left, 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 left hanging. We can talk about it another time, perhaps. Is that which created the universe, those forces, active in the universe? But up to that point, science says, we, you are correct. The, the definition of the biblical God is predates time, outside of time. God is not a physical being, is, is a force, and it creates the universe. You'll notice that the opening chapter of Genesis, the only name for God is Elohim, God as manifest in the universe. Science has indeed discovered the biblical God. Well, we just need one part left, crucial, that which created the universe is also active in the universe itself. The very fact that you're watching this now pretty much establishes that point. So here's the question. 
Has science discovered God? Well, Einstein didn't believe it was possible, but Stephen Hawking said it might be the greatest scientific discovery of all time. So, what discovery has baffled the greatest scientific minds of the past century, and why has it caused them to rethink the origin of our universe? Well, new and more powerful telescopes have unlocked mysteries about our universe never before revealed, giving us amazing new scientific insight into the origin of life. Has science discovered God? <laughs> Wait a minute, hasn't science proven we don't need God to explain the universe? What is it about this discovery that is so fundamentally different, and why has it stunned the scientific world? Well, this discovery, along with what molecular biologists have learned about the sophisticated coding within DNA, have many scientists now admitting that the universe and life itself appear to be part of a grand design. One cosmologist put it this way, many scientists, when they admit their views, incline toward the design argument. Surprisingly, many scientists who are now talking about God have no religious belief whatsoever. So, what are these stunning discoveries that have scientists suddenly speaking of God? Well, there are three revolutionary discoveries from the fields of astronomy and molecular biology that really stand out. One, the universe had a beginning. Two, the universe is just right for life. And three, DNA coding reveals intelligence. The statements leading scientists have made about these discoveries may shock you. Let's take a look. The universe had a one-time beginning. Since the dawn of civilization, man has gazed in awe at the stars, wondering what they are and how they got there. Although on a clear night, the unaided human eye can see only about 6,000 stars, Hubble and other powerful telescopes reveal there are a billion trillion stars clustered in over 100 billion galaxies. In fact, our sun is like one grain of sand amidst the world's beaches. But prior to the 20th century, the majority of scientists believed our own Milky Way galaxy was the entire universe and that only about 100 million stars existed. Most scientists of the past believed that our universe never had a beginning. They believed that mass, space, and energy that compose our entire universe had always existed. But in the early 20th century, astronomer Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe is expanding. Rewinding the process mathematically, he calculated that everything in the universe, including matter, energy, space, and even time itself, actually had a beginning. Well, shockwaves hit the scientific community. Many scientists, including Einstein, reacted negatively. In what Einstein later called the biggest blunder of my life, he fudged the equations to avoid the implication that the universe had a beginning. Well, perhaps the most vocal adversary of the idea that the universe had a beginning was British astronomer Sir Frederick Hoyle, who sarcastically nicknamed the creation event a Big Bang. He stubbornly held to his steady state theory that the universe had always existed. Well, so did Einstein and other scientists until the evidence for a beginning became overwhelming. The logical conclusion was like the proverbial elephant in the room, namely that something or someone beyond scientific investigation must have started it all. Then finally, in 1992, the COBE satellite experiments proved that the universe really did have a one-time beginning in an incredible flash of light and energy. Although some scientists called it the moment of creation, most preferred referring to it as the Big Bang. Astronomer Robert Jasso tries to help us imagine how it all began. The picture suggests the explosion of a cosmic hydrogen bomb. The instant in which the cosmic bomb exploded marked the birth of the universe. So the conclusion is, Everything in the universe came from nothing. 
Science is unable to tell us what or who caused the universe to begin, but some believe it clearly points to a creator. Well, British theorist Edward Milne wrote a mathematical treatise on relativity which concluded by saying, as to the first cause of the universe in the context of expansion, that is left to the reader to insert, but our picture is incomplete without him. Another British scientist, Edmund Whitaker, attributed the beginning of our universe to divine will constituting nature from nothingness. Many scientists were struck by the parallel of a one-time creation event from nothing with the biblical creation account in Genesis 1.1. Prior to this discovery, many scientists regard the biblical account of creation from nothing as unscientific. Although he called himself an agnostic, Robert Jastrow was compelled by the evidence to admit, now we see how the astronomical evidence leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. Another similar statement came from agnostic George Smoot, the Nobel Prize winning scientist in charge of the Kobe experiment. He put it like this, there is no doubt that a parallel exists between the Big Bang as an event and the Christian notion of creation from nothing. Scientists who used to scoff at the Bible's account of creation are now admitting that the biblical concept of creation from nothing has been right all along. Cosmologists who specialize in the study of the universe and its origins soon realized that a chance cosmic explosion could never bring about life any more than a nuclear bomb would unless it was precisely engineered to do so. And that meant a designer must have planned it. They began using words like super intellect, creator, and even supreme being to describe this designer. Why is this? Because the universe is finely tuned for life. Physicists calculated that for life to exist, Gravity and the other laws of physics that govern our universe needed to be intricately tuned just right or our universe couldn't exist. For instance, did you know that if the expansion rate of the universe had been slightly weaker, gravity would have pulled all matter back into a big crunch? Okay, um, this takes us into point number two, which we will take up next week. We'll have different videos next week. One is just spectacular. It takes a, a little bit of uh, explanation to tell you the characters that are involved uh, because what you will see are going to be all atheists who have to reckon with the fact. One who is I, I, I'm just profoundly impressed with from uh, Texas, PhD, Nobel Prize winner, uh, is, is, is talking to Dawkins in an interview, and his body language says it all as he's trying to explain to Dawkins the, and he's, his hand's doing like this. The, you don't understand the fix we're in. You don't understand the fix we're in. The conclusions are giving you more and more evidence. And if you're just fair, skeptics, if you're just fair, then where you should be after just seeing the first point should be something that's taking you to preponderance. But after you see next week, I... I I just want you to have an open mind. I just want you to have an open mind like that young whippersnapper skeptic from many years ago that I talk about in chapter five. All right, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we can be together and just um, see the statements and the facts as they have rolled out so exquisitely in the past uh, 30 years or so. And let this be a help to some folks. Let them be able to take these videos and this information and websites and share it with individuals uh, at their homes, at, at coffee shops. Uh, let this be a source of information that will edify them and others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you next week. Page to page 15. Homework. <laughs>